This is February 5th, 2002. We're in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates, and we're privileged to have with us today Frank Palilla. Is that correct? That's Palilla? Uh, yes. Frank, welcome. We're very glad to have you with us today. My pleasure. May I ask you when you were born? Uh, February 10th, uh, 1925. And your current address? Framingham. And uh, where were you born? I was born in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Were you really? Yes, Avenue A and 9th Street. So you're I don't remember that, though. <laughs> I mean, I was young when we moved from there. Oh, uh, that was uh, 76 years ago, something like that? Almost 77. Yeah. And your uh, current marital status? I'm married. Children? Two, two children, and, two daughters. And grandchildren? Uh, two. So, and you're, excuse me, we have somebody coming in. <clears throat> Where and when did you enter the military of the United States? I believe it was in April of 1943. I had, uh, had one year of college behind me at Brooklyn College, and right after the first year I was uh, inducted. Inducted, does that mean you were drafted yes. into the armed forces? Yes. Did you have any... Um, opportunity to decide which of the services you would go into or was it army 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 I, I think I never I really didn't give it much thought I just wanted to be part of the military and I never even questioned uh, what branch I would like to be I just your number literally came up and you were drafted into the army that's correct and um, I might say that I would have been disappointed had I not been inducted I was anxious to join. The you forces. were anxious to go in. In '43, uh, did any other folks go in with you at the time? Classmates or people from your neighborhood, or, uh, or did, were you all by yourself when I, you went in? I believe my brother-in-law had joined the Navy, and I believe my brother had been drafted as well, uh, and uh, a few of the older friends that I had. But in my age group, I, I think I was the only one so at that time. when you were called, you were all on your own? Yes. Okay. Where did you uh, get called to? I think it was um, Camp Upton in New York. Uh, yeah, we got the, picked up a train on Pennsylvania Avenue in Manhattan, and we went to Upton, New York. And w was that a kind of processing center? It was for the inductees, yes. Uh, okay. You, generally at places like that, um, the Army gives you some kind of tests to decide what they're going to do with you, what kind of skills you'll be taught. Yeah. Is, is, do you remember any of that? I, I don't remember whether that took place before basic training or after basic training. My basic training took place at uh, Camp Grant in Illinois. Uh, and I do remember taking aptitude tests and intelligent tests. And I had the choice then of, I had some background in music. I could have joined the special services. Uh, but I felt that I wanted something a little bit more satisfying. I was very had that patriotic spirit at that time and wanted something a little bit, what I consider that that time, more meaningful. Special uh, Services has a, a totally different connotation today. Uh, what did Special Services mean then? Uh, I would have joined a military band, would have played the piano, and would have entertained troops. Um, that's what I would have done. I also um, thought I might go to Officers Candidate School and I was eligible for it on the basis of the IQ tests and the uh, aptitude tests, but they had just passed a new law that you had to be 20 years old because they were having difficulties with the older recruits taking orders from youngsters. And, and so they set an age of, of, you had to be a minimum of 20. And what were you? I was 18. 18. Just 18. So. 
you had a choice then whether or not to play music or to do something else in the army. Yes. And you chose, uh, was it infantry? Uh, uh, no, I didn't make that choice. I, I just knew that I didn't want to just play the piano. So I you wound up in the infantry. So I wound up at medical technician school. After basic training, they sent me to, uh, I forget exactly where, but it was the southern part someplace. Okay, let's, uh, let's stick with uh, Camp Grant first. Is that where you went for basic training? That's where I went for basic training. The usual parading around and, and the calisthenics. Uh, um, it was again. It was a fun time for me. I was young and I thought it was you know a break from home and uh, so I uh, I was very enthusiastic. Were, were, did you learn uh, weapons and shooting rifles and things like that? Yeah, I wasn't too good with the rifles. I I don't recall that we did that much in terms of. Uh, you know, actual combat situations. I, I remember more the calisthenics, I think, and the various uh, schoolings and, and lessons. Uh, and uh, I also remember a good part of the time I spent at uh, the local PX where there was a piano and I would play the piano and the guys would join in and we'd have a lot of fun. So to me it was a fun time. I didn't mind the calisthenics at all. Where was, where's Camp Grant? Illinois. Um, Is it no, no, wait. Indiana. North or south of Chicago or I, I remember visiting part of the state? going to Chicago on a weekend, so it had to be close to Chicago. I don't remember whether it was Indiana or Illinois. I think it was, I'm not sure. Okay. And from there, you went to somewhere, now you just said medical technical? Medical te technician school. Okay. Where was that? Uh, that was, in, again, I don't recall. Um, but it, it was a fairly intensive course. We learned God, almost any field in the biology uh, industry, we learned uh, serology, hematology, parasitology, you know, you name it, that it had anything to do with uh, the biological field, that's what we studied. Toward what end? Were you going to be what was at a, that time? We didn't corner? know. We didn't know. We thought that most of us would end up in the general hospital, either uh, here in America or overseas. That's what we all expected. And as a matter of fact, that's where most of the fellows did uh, end up. Uh, I, in terms, I guess maybe because they thought I was psychologically fit for it, I was sent to North Africa and I joined an infantry division there. Um, okay, let's, whereas most of the other fellows ended up in general hospitals. Let's get back to this training though. It sounds very intensive. And how long did it last? Did, oh, you several remember? months. And I remember I graduated with the highest grade ever. Seven and months? Several months. Oh, several. Okay. Yeah. And I remember I had an uh, average grade over 93. Uh, which was the highest ever for anyone that attended that uh, technician school. And, and so I would, by that time I realized that we were all about to end up in some general hospital someplace and that's what I expected. So when they sent me overseas and I ended up in North Africa, I, I was somewhat surprised. I had been now already separated from all the other students and I ended up with the infantry. Uh, and uh, they, as far as I know, they all ended up in general hospitals. You used a phrase just a second ago about uh, being psychologically prepared or uh, mature. How did they arrive at that conclusion? I don't know, but uh, that's, that's what I was told by uh, the person that was heading that organization at that time. Tell us about going overseas. Did you uh, get on a ship someplace? And yes. Whereabouts? Uh, after the schooling, uh, we were given a furlough, went back home, and it was at that time that I proposed to my childhood sweetheart, asked her to wait for me. And uh, then we left on a, um, uh, I forget what you call the ships, the small ships, maybe held 500 of us. And we went to, we left from, I believe it was from Virginia. We left from Virginia and we went to North Africa. 
and we were in a waiting situation at that point. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but I think we were waiting for uh, preparations for the invasion of Sicily and the invasion of Anzio. Can you put a date on any of this, Frank, uh, approximately when it was, uh, uh, what time of the year and what year it was? I, I think it was early 1944. So you sailed overseas just before D-Day in Europe. Yes. Well, you wind up in North Africa. Right. I was unaware of D-Day at that time. And all I know that we were going to concentrate probably in Italy. Uh, that, that was our expectation. But again, you know, we, we were not permitted to have any diaries or anything like that. I was young and... Uh, to me, I was just more concerned about the excitement I was going to have rather than anything else. You were a, kind of a young guy out of New York, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell us about North Africa. What, what was that like? Okay, we, we didn't stay there very much. We slept in pup tents. We were out in uh, terrain that was relatively flat. And we didn't do too much there. I think it was just a matter of a couple of weeks that we spent there, maybe a month. Uh, again, in a sort of waiting situation. And uh, my, I guess, recollection of, of history is that there was a, a huge concentration going on there that uh, more and more supplies, that you guys were getting ready for something. Uh, yeah, except that I had not been involved in that phase of it. and. Uh, uh, something very interesting happened to me at that time. Somehow or other, I, I was introduced to Lucky Luciano, who was at that time a, uh, uh, a mafioso uh, head uh, who had been incarcerated at the time. And I didn't know this at the time, but there was a secret agreement between he and President Roosevelt and General Eisenhower that if he would assist us in the invasion of uh, Italy, that he would be released from jail at that point, then after the invasion took place, he would be brought back to this country, spend the rest of the war in jail, but then after the war he would be uh, sent back to his native land uh, in Italy. Uh, um, I was just vaguely aware, aware of this at that time, but it was very interesting to be associated with him <clears throat> because I didn't wear my uniform. I was dressed in civilian clothes and we would go on some of these reconnaissance missions. But mostly his, his participation was more to mingle with the partisans and convince the Italians to come to our side. And, you know, wherever he went, he had already been expected and he, we always got a tremendous welcoming uh, situation, but there were times when we were also in enemy-occupied territory and other times when our troops would catch up to us and then we'd uh, indicate to them the things that we had observed as far as the uh, military, the artillery installations were concerned, the few that we did see, but mostly how we were convincing, we, he was convincing the Italians uh, to come to our side. What was your rank at this time, Frank? At that time, I think I had, um, I think I was a PFC, a private first class. Okay. And I don't... It, this is, this is an important historical s story. I, I don't think people have heard this before. I don't think it's ever been revealed. John. Is there a, was there a time when you were standing around and they, and your captain or somebody called you in and said, I want you to meet somebody. Uh, did, how were you introduced to Lucky Luciano? Hmm. I was told that I was given this assignment that since I was familiar with the language or the sound of the language, that I was the only one. This was a, I joined a group that originated in the Midwestern part of the country. Very, in fact, I don't know of any person at that time that uh, was actually Italian. I mean, I'm not Italian, I'm, I'm the son of Italians. Um, you had some fluency with the language? Well, I was though. familiar with the sound yeah. because my parents, 
who had immigrated to this country, they spoke Italian and I, and I would respond in English. And that's how we conversed at home. So All I was right. familiar with the sound. All right, so you, you had an assignment to work with this man. Had you heard about Luciano and his uh, background? Uh, it, I guess uh, everybody had. I, I knew about him, but yeah. I didn't know in detail. Uh, and I didn't even know until after a couple of weeks that, that this was an agreement that he had made with General Eisenhower and with President Roosevelt. And I don't think it's ever been officially uh, documented. I don't know. I guess in Washington they must have Okay, but as a PFC, what specifically were you told to do with Lucky Luciano? Just be with him and, if necessary, interpret. Try to facilitate any dialogue uh, between, you know, the Americans and the Italians. Mm -hmm. um, he, he did a pretty good job himself. I mean, he was able to manage the English language as well, but um, somehow they, they wanted, uh, maybe they, there was some other reason why they had me there. I don't were, know. were you in the ironic position of being Lucky Luciano's bodyguard? Not a bodyguard, no, no. not a bodyguard. Just like, more or less a companion, almost like a son. You know, that sort of relationship. Okay, now, the invasion starts. You, were you part of the invading force? Uh, yes, at that time then, well, I was, I was like a, a second row of medics. I wasn't the, at that time, I wasn't a medic that was directly with the fighting infantry. I was right behind them. I was like at a battalion station rather than mm -hmm. the really front lines. Where did you go ashore, Frank? Uh, through Anzio. Through Anzio. Through Anzio. That was a very difficult landing. Very difficult uh, area. And Can you tell uh, us something about that? Um, well, if, as far as I was concerned, since I was the second group of medics, um, I at that particular time I didn't see too much, too many injuries, too many wounded. But it was after that, and it happened very quickly. Uh, it, it seemed like you know just days after, well, we were stuck there for a while at uh, Monte Castello, I believe it is. Casino? Monte Casino. And then right after that, everything seemed to break through, and before I know it, it was just days when I was going through Rome. Uh, so, again, you're, you're, very vague at Your that recollection time. is not entirely accurate. It was uh, quite a, you guys were held up for quite a while there. Oh, yeah. You I'm were in the 5th Army then, is that correct? In the 5th Army, yeah. exactly, yes. So under Mark Clark, under the... Under Mark Clark. And, yeah. And I received a citation from him because of my uh, involvement with Lucky Luciano. I didn't realize how important it was at that time. Uh, but apparently it was important enough for General Clark to see to it that I got a citation for that. And uh, the citation was given to me when we were on a rest area and uh, we had a regular ceremony and my picture was taken and it appeared in the New York papers, hero from Brooklyn, that sort of thing. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, Can you tell us how was Luciano received by the Italians? What was their response to uh, learning who he is and what he was there for? There was never any, uh, any doubt on their part who he was, and there was never any doubt on my part that he was an important individual. No matter where we went, we were welcomed, we were practically celebrated. Uh, I, I think one time he even, I, I was interested in, I forgot what town it was, I wanted to see what a local prison was like. Uh, without any hesitation, you know, they were, I was permitted to go into this prison and give cigarettes to the prisoners and all that. And, uh, and because of my association with him, there was never any fear that I would be harmed or anything like that. I remember that. Uh, so it was. So he a, was your bodyguard. <laughs> in a way, he was my bodyguard. Uh, but as I said, no matter where we went, he was already expected and welcomed. So we always got the red carpet treatment. Let's take up a little point here. You were not in uniform. You were in the clothes of a typical the native Italian. Clothing, yeah. That's under the Articles of War. You're a spy. 
I didn't think of it at the time. I, I just thought, wow, what, a, what an opportunity. I really am uh, lucky. Well, they, they gave you a good opportunity to get shot if, if you were caught by the Germans. Yeah. I, I, I didn't realize it at that time. And I don't know if it would have even concerned me. Uh, all I knew I was doing something that I thought was exciting. Can you give us an example of uh, Luciano comes into a little town or a village? He's introduced by you or by himself. Did he have meetings with the leaders, the partisans? Huh. I don't know. They weren't formal meetings or anything like that, but I know that he, you know, he would be speaking to people, they would, uh, men would be all around them and they'd be discussing things and, but again, I really, I didn't realize what it was, the, you know, the, the completeness of it. And what they, does he, what did he want them to do? He just wanted them to be sure that they would side with the Americans, with the Allies, uh, and they did. They did. I mean, they uh, because when when our troops would catch up to us, they were very well received by all the natives, and a lot of the Italian military people uh, also, you know, just just didn't fight us. They just let us come through. Wouldn't they have been without Luciano? Oh, I I really don't know. I I think so. I think the I think the Italians at that time just needed someone to maybe mm -hmm. encourage uh, the alliance with the Americans. But I myself was not conscious of it, except the fact that, oh, well, they're, they're on our side. Look at that. They're yeah. not fighting us. So that sort of thing on my part. Where did you go? Uh, can you remember you were heading north or west or which? Oh, no, which we one? were going north. Uh, in fact, from there on in, that's all it was. Just, we just, I was with the entire Italian campaign up to the Po Valley and ended up up in Gorizia, but it was always north. And uh, was Luciano with you all this oh, time? Oh, no, no, no. After Anzio, then that was it. I, uh, okay, uh, you lost sight of him. You lost sight of him, right. Yeah, and, okay. Uh, but I never knew what the disposition was until after the war. I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, let's get Luciano out of the story so we can continue with yeah, your military yeah, experience. Yeah, because it, But tell us, you t told me earlier that he came back to the States having successfully done what he said he would do. Yes. Tell us what happened to him. As far as I know, as far as I know, he was uh, incarcerated again, uh, waiting for the end of the war, in which case the agreement was that he would be uh, released and sent back to his native land. And as far as I know, uh, this didn't happen right away because Roosevelt had passed away in the meantime and Truman had not been uh, apprised of the situation and he had to be convinced that this was a true agreement and I don't believe that he was uh, released from prison until 1946 in which case he was sent back to Naples. Were you ever called as a witness um, as to this agreement? This was a kind of gentleman's agreement? Did anybody no, ask you I was, what he did? No, no. because it was, I don't think it's ever been officially yeah. stated. Uh, you know, I think, I think there was a movie picture, uh, I think it was The Seven Sins, where there's one scene where one person comes into the bar, and it's a mafiosa hell bar. And one remark is made about how important Lucky Luciano, what an important part he played in the invasion of Sicily, and that's the only instance that I am aware of, of any confirmation of what my experience was. I don't think it has ever been publicly made known that this took place. So, so you were a, a big chunk of history that uh, yeah, I, I didn't realize it at the time. Or? I realized it afterwards, but yeah. not at that time. Okay, and you know, and it wasn't that long a period of my uh, of my military career. So, you know, a couple of months out of all the time I spent in the military, and at that time it wasn't that important. Except it was something exciting for me, that's and like even you. then I didn't realize how important a figure he was. Well, that's a um, very important sidelight here, and we thank you for it today. So let's pick up on you now as a medical technician in the army as it's moving north 
Um, what did you do like on a daily basis? Okay, on a daily basis then I was really attached to the 361st Infantry Division and we were in battle or resting from battle, but these were frontline troops. And uh, we did the entire Italian campaign, very treacherous terrain, uh, lots of casualties, and I was mostly a, I served as a litter bearer, I would volunteer as a litter bearer, but mostly I would be uh, the person tagging the injured people and sending them back to battalion headquarters. Uh, so, you know, as again, a frontline medic, uh, take care of any wounded soldiers, and uh, one of the things that, uh, I, I don't think I was the only one that defied the international laws, uh, in that if there were casualties, if it was your responsibility to save that person, most likely to be saved rather than, you know, distinguishing between a German or an American. But my inclination was always to treat the American first. Um, so, you know, there maybe I, I, I didn't do what, would, what a true soldier would have done, I'm not sure. But all I knew was I was going to take care of the American before I took care of an enemy. Was this um, at, at a kind of aid station or a field hospital? What was the oh, situation? No, we, no that, that was already behind us. I was actually with the infantry, the, the fighting infantry. You're up picking guys off the ground. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So typically um, there's a battle scene. You come right after the infantry, uh, after the fight. Right. Or and now there's wounded lying around. I was with them as they got wounded. Uh, I myself was wounded twice, but... Uh, but the one thing where I did obey the international laws, I didn't, uh, I didn't carry any weapons with me, uh, but neither did I wear my Red Cross helmet. Because the Red Cross people, the, the medics, were real good targets as far as the enemy were concerned, because I think the philosophy was, and statistically at that time, that if you got one medic, that was the equivalent of getting 10 infantry guys because that one medic can salvage and save 10 infantry wounded and get them back into battle. I think that was the philosophy at that time, so I never wore my Red Cross. And neither did my, uh, my co-workers. You felt uh, you were a target. Uh, you oh, would we, be shot at, picked out deliberately by the Germans now we're talking oh, yeah, about? Oh yeah, yeah. And, you know, there were, there were two instances when I was wounded, and it was, you know, it was obvious because we were medics. Uh, the, my first occasion for a Purple Heart, uh, it was, a, I think it was Mount Benny. I think that was the name of the mountain, but anyway, it was a mountain site. And to get to these, this wounded uh, uh, soldier, we had to go through a, the side of a mountain, there was a narrow path which was clearly visible from, you know, uh, the, the surrounding terrain. And the first time the four of us, four medics carrying a litter, went through that, we weren't fired upon. But once we had our wounded soldier and we were coming back, uh, they, they, they sprayed us with, the, you know, machine gun fire. And it broke the litter and it hit, got me on my, uh, you know, uh, right side here. Uh, have a very slight scar left from that. Uh, but, you know, we were obviously the target. There were four medics there, and they were with a litter and a wounded soldier. And, you know, normally you would think, well, they, they shouldn't fire on the, these guys. I mean, they're, they're saving somebody's life. But, hey, those, those, that machine gun was all around us. At that time, were you wearing a helmet with the big Red Cross on No, it? no, I never wore the Red Cross. I had the helmet on, but I didn't have the Red Cross on it. I, I don't think any of us did at that time. Maybe one of them was wearing a Red Cross. I don't think so. I think we all felt the same way, that we're just providing a target uh, with the Red Cross. And, and we'd be telling them, hey, I'm a military, I'm a medical guy, I'm yeah. going to save 10 soldiers, you know, so you better get me. So you're shot in the leg. Hmm. Uh, were any of the other three shot? Yeah, I, I know that we all ended up sent back to the aid station, which was, you know, just behind the actual... 
Who comes out and picks you up? Oh, we, we, we picked up the, the soldier and the litter. We, we took him out. We, we got him out to the other Wounded side. as you were. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it wasn't really that bad a wound. I mean, it was a surface wound, actually. Yeah. You know, I just got a, bit of, a very faint scar left from that. And, uh, you know, the fact that we got away with it, hey, that we, did, we did a good job. Had you not been wounded, what would you have done with this guy when you got him back to where you were taking him? Would, what was your job? Okay, when we first picked him up, we put yes. a sulfidizing patch on there. I think he was wounded in the stomach, not in the stomach, on the side here. We patched him up, and that was it, because then when we got to the other side, then we would get to a place where a jeep would pick him up and take him to what they call the battalion aid station. And then from there on in, he'd be tagged, and uh, whether he'd be sent back or not, we don't know. Most of the time, they would be sent. They would be sent to a hospital briefly, and then, if they were good enough, they were sent back into to fight, or they'd be sent home. But I hardly ever saw the disposition once that was over. Uh, now there, now, so I, I don't think I was even hospitalized at that time. I think I stayed at the aid station for a couple of days and then went back. Uh, now there was another time where, again, just to indicate the preference they had for, mili for medical people, uh, we were, this was now further north yet. I, I think it was near Bologna, I'm not sure. Uh, but there were two wounded, wounded uh, soldiers that we had to get, and we went with a jeep this time. There were five medics in the jeep, and we had to go through a hairpin turn. Very visible hairpin turn, very visible in that mountainous area. And again, the first time when we went to pick up the wounded, no problems at all. But the Germans had already zeroed in on that particular turn, so on our way back, now we were seven in the Jeep, there were two wounded soldiers plus the five of us. As soon as we hit the, the apex of that turn, uh, the, the only thing I remember was that we were bombed, we hit with a couple of shells. The, I was sitting next to the driver, his head ended up in my lap, his brains were all over me. And it happened almost instantaneously. Next thing I knew, I found myself on a roadside ditch. And uh, turns out I was the only survivor. And at that time, um, I remember some guys coming from the aid station to help me out of, the, out of the ditch. And my belt buckle had been sheared off, just to indicate how close that came from just ripping my stomach apart. Uh, so that uh, on that occasion, I got my second purple heart. I, oh, I think I also got a bronze star the first time and a cluster for that particular incident there. So I was very lucky. That time, I think they sent me back to the hospital for about a week or so, not so much for the wound as it was psychological. The trauma. Just, yeah, the trauma. the trauma. But I went back. I went back and uh, went, finished the entire Italian campaign and ended up in Gorizia. And I, I distinctly remember, I mean, we lost so many people because of the terrain, including medics, that I remember that it was just my best, the person who subsequently served as my best man. He and I were the only two of the original group that started out right after Anzio in this medical detachment. So he and I are the only ones that I remember survived that. <coughs> Not that they were all killed. A lot of them went back from mental exhaustion. Um, one person actually shot, his, shot himself in the, in the leg, so he was in the toe, so he would be, be sent back. Uh, but most of them were wounded. Uh, uh, I always had a somewhat of a particular sympathy for the drivers because uh, the one driver that I just described, I mean, that was a horrible thing. And, I was able to survive that, but I also remember I became very uh, friendly with one of our subsequent drivers. And uh, I remember at one time we were in this old castle and, and we were bombed and uh, I don't know how it happened, but all of a sudden he got hit in the back with um, shrapnel wound. He fell in front of me and the blood came actually like a well coming, 
just spurting out from his back. He, had, he didn't have a shirt on. We were washing up at the time. And I remember trying to stop the blood. Frank, would you like a, a drink of water? Let's take a second here. Okay. This guy that became your best man, which, which I think is a, is a yeah. neat story by itself. Do you guys ever sit around and tell stories or have you just completely, that's another world, another life? It, it turned out to be another world, another life, but he was from West Virginia. Uh, after the war, uh, my brother, my friends, they had not been discharged. I was one of the first people discharged. Um, because I had accumulated so many points. Mm. Uh, and so normally my brother would have been my best man or my best childhood friend would have been my best man, but there was no one here. Uh, and uh, he was from West Virginia. Uh, we, I contacted him and asked him if he would, you know, serve as my best man, and he was very happy. So he, he came with his wife and his two sister-in-laws and they came to New York. We were in New York at the time. And they participate in the wedding, and we had a marvelous time. They spent the weekend. Uh, in fact, they spent about four days uh, with us in New York. In fact, my honeymoon constituted me going from Brooklyn to Manhattan because we couldn't leave the city at that time. Um, because they had not yet decided what they were going to do with me, so I couldn't leave New York City. And our honeymoon was at the Knickerbocker Hotel in Manhattan, and, and my best man and his uh, wife and his two sister-in-law stayed in the same hotel and we had a marvelous time. We went to Coney Island, that sort of thing. Um, and then subsequent to that, we kept in touch with each other for a long time, uh, for years. And he was, turned out that he was a forest ranger in West Virginia. And then he was at least 10 years older than I was. So, uh, you know, after a while we just lost track of each other. I remember we hadn't been in contact for a while, and I, I, I contacted the police department in West Virginia and hid the town where he lived to find out what happened to him. And it turned out he was there, and that's when I found out he had taken this job as a, as a forest ranger. And so he wasn't like um, in a populated area for most of the time because that was his job. But, and then we could contact a little bit more, you know. Uh, for another length of time, but then you know, after a while we just lost track of each other. That's a neat story too. Yeah. Let's get back, I'm sorry to put you back into the army. Oh, that's okay, <laughs> yeah. But you're up in northern Italy and you've got through a rough time. Uh, can you tell us about when this was? Okay, and this is when the best thing happened to me. Okay, we were in Bologna and, and Gorizia in a holding position and there, at that time there had been some conflict between the Italians and the Yugoslavians that, uh, that we were aware of, but uh, we weren't participating in that. I mean, we were just in a holding position waiting for something to happen. And then we got the word, while we were waiting, I had asked for uh, leave in order for me to visit my parents' homeland in Sicily, their hometown where they had been born and all that. And that was the most, most exciting thing that happened to me. You were in Italy and you wanted to go over to Sicily. Right. And the army uh, let you do this? Yeah, they, 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 they gave us a, a, they gave me and Joe Galetti, one of my friends at that time too, uh, leave for 30 days and we hopped planes. I remember our the first war was still going on? Uh, no, the, the, the war in Europe had ended. Oh, okay. okay. We, we kind of missed that. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that's when we ended up in Gorizia, the war. Okay. okay? Um, so while we were waiting for subsequent orders, uh, they permitted me and this friend Joe Galani to take a 30-day um, special assignment. I, no, it wasn't special assignment. It was something else. I forget what the term was. But anyway, we hopped a couple of planes. We had to do it all on our own. So we hopped a couple of planes, and the first one was a little British plane, I remember that. Uh, and then while we were going, then the, our last leg of the flight from Naples to Palermo, uh, we were in a C-47, 
and we had engine problems and we had reached the point of no return where we couldn't go back to Naples and we had to continue on and then when we got to Palermo we couldn't land in Palermo because they didn't have emergency equipment and so we had to continue on to Nice here in Africa and I was really excited because I figured wow if we crash we're going to have newspaper people they're going to take pictures of us how exciting that would be and my friend and you know it is true that when you you're frightened enough you can defecate you know and that's what he did and uh, he got so frightened he just and I thought it was funny which it wasn't but anyway so and, anyway and we're all this while you're thinking of getting your picture in the paper yeah, to yeah. that's so unclear I'm, so on I'm, the concept isn't <laughs> it? so I'm watching you know the, the fire trucks and the ambulances uh, on the at the airport field in Tunisia I think it was Tunisia I'm watching them and I'm getting all excited wow look at that we're gonna have a crash land and we're gonna get our pictures in the paper and the guy came in and he psh, the smoothest landing ever so that took care of that <laughs> So I was a little disappointed, but then from there, we, uh, another day or so, we got a plane to take us to Palermo uh, uh, in Sicily. And then from there, we, um, we paid our way through cigarettes and chocolate bars, and we got a taxi to take us to Agrigento. And from Agrigento, we, took a final, uh, we got a final lift with two chocolate bars to take me to this little town way on top of a hill. Uh, part of the province of Agrigento, but a separate town, way on top of a hill. And that's where my parents uh, originated. And uh, I mean, well, we, we, my friends, we, when we were in Palermo, we visited his aunt, who was in a nearby town, Rosalia. She was a nun living there. And we spent one day with her before we went to uh, Agrigento. When we got to Agrigento, and then we had, we had a Get a lift to the narrow, the town where my parents came from, and uh, I remember walking into Piazza. Now, by this time, it was more than a year since they had seen any Americans, and so as we're walking into the Piazza, you, you hear all that, hey, Americano, Americano, Americano. I walked into the barber shop, and uh, I asked them where this person, where I could find this one person. They asked me why, who was I, and I told them. As soon as I mentioned my, my father's name and my mother's name, in minutes that piazza was full of people greeting us because they were either related to my parents or they were friends of theirs. So it was a very, very joyous occasion. We spent five beautiful days there. Um, it was very emotional too because uh, uh, I stayed with my mother's twin sister for the five days we were really? And she had four sisters all together, but one of them was an identical twin. And because she was an identical twin, and I decided to stay with her. I, I calmed everybody else down that wanted me to spend the time with them, you know. But so, so at least that took care of that one situation because the Italians are very, uh, are not jealous that way, but you know, if there's somebody that they know, they want to be the ones hosting that person. So it was fortunate that she was my mother's twin and, and she looked identical to my mother and, and so we stayed with her. Did you take pictures of her? And, no, at that uh, time I didn't. I had, known, I had known her very vaguely before she had come to America at the time that my mother came. Uh, but then her husband wanted to go back to Italy and they had gone back. So I remembered her very vaguely but it was the first time I saw her after many, many years and the first time I met my mother's other sisters and her nieces and all that and in my father's case I, I met his cousins and met my cousins um, my second cousins who were one funny thing there was at that time I had blondish hair and blue eyes which is unusual for a Sicilian and uh, and sure enough among all the people that were there there was another fellow just about my age whom I'm still in contact with who also had light hair and blue eyes so we decided between us that it had to be someone before our grandfather that did some fooling mm -hmm. around. <laughs> uh, so that was funny, but, um, but we had a good time. And in my father's case, not only did I meet uh, you know, his first cousins and my second cousin, but in his case, I saw not only the, the house that he lived in, the, the bedroom that he was born in, the actual bed in which he was born. That was very emotional. So That's family. 
Yeah. That's family. Yeah. So, so you guys had 30 days in which to do this. Then you get back to your okay, outfit. Now we got back. By the time I got back, we got the word that we were going to the Pacific. Okay, because the war in the Pacific is right still because, on. Yeah. because they st they needed seasoned troops. Yeah, and uh, in preparation for that, they decided to send us back home for a thirty day furlough, and then we'd go on to the Pacific. I got in touch with my wife. I told her, you know, why don't we get married during that furlough? Uh, which you know, on second thought, was if I were the parent at that time, I would have rebelled against it because here's this one guy, no background, he just barely made one war, he's going to another war and he's going to marry my daughter. I'm surprised that they didn't put up a fuss. But nonetheless, uh, my wife arranged for our wedding. And wait, 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 where did you sail from? Oh, from, um, they took us from there, they took us by truck to Gorizia. And we were going to sail from Gorizia to, uh, I guess we were coming to New York. That's where we did come, New York. So anyway, I, I I was in contact with her, told her to get ready, we'll get married, if she were willing, and she, of course she was willing. And the day I got on the boat to come here for the furlough and then to the Pacific, that's when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. And, uh, and by the time I got here, we came back on a bigger ship this time, it took us nine days. We were delayed on the way, so my wife had to shift all the plans for the wedding. Uh, because we didn't know that the war was going to end. So, uh, but anyway, the, the bomb was dropped on the day I got on the boat to come here. And uh, then once I got here, we went through with the wedding. But then they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, so I the kept, army. The army didn't yeah. know what to do with me. So I, I, uh, I think that happened in November. No, that happened a couple of months before. But I was, you know. Still with the army, but on furlough, an extended furlough beyond the 30 days. I think I was altogether three months before they decided to go by the uh, point system, and that's when I received my discharge. Where? Uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. And with what rank? What, what oh, rank? I was technical uh, technician fourth grade at that time. I was about to get a field commission um, because now I was 20 years old. And I had served so well and, you know, gotten all these awards and citations. And I was about to get a field commission as a lieutenant. But then the war ended. And I got as field. part of that offer, did you have to sign up again? Did they say, we'll give you a commission if you stay another two years or four years? I don't think so. Uh, it's such a vague... Tom, I don't even know that the, that the army official and the government knew what to do with us because we were hanging around three months, you know, and that was all, that wasn't even counted as furlough anymore so that when I was finally discharged, I got a terminal leave of something like $600, which was a lot of money at that time. That would For, buy a car. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I don't remember, but I know I was going to get the field commission. I didn't have to go to school or anything like that. I was just going to get a field commission. But that never materialized it, because they discharged me instead. You, when we started this interview, you were all gung-ho about getting into the Army. How gung-ho were you after going through all that combat and then thought you were on your way to Pacific? What, what did you think about the that? The only time it affected me was after I was discharged. And, you know, I'd be laying in bed, and uh, at that time the cars used to backfire. I don't think cars backfire anymore when you get that big pop at the, at the exhaust. You know, something like that would happen. I'd be startled, and I'd jump up, and it would bring back memories. But uh, I didn't have time to do anything else because I was now married, and I had to get a career, I had to go back to school. So, and we had to find housing because there was no housing at the time. Yeah, so I, I was meant, preoccupied with all these other spe things. Specifically, you're on a ship in Italy and you're going to be shipped over to the invasion of Japan. Um, were you as anxious then as you had been at the beginning of your career? Mm, I don't think so. I would, but I was more concerned about the marriage that yeah. was impending. I was more thinking more about that than anything else. I, I just assumed, well, you know, it will be more of the same. I had no idea what the war in the Pacific was like, you know, jungles and all that. I had no idea of that. That's a uh, good point. 
you guys in Italy, Army, very caught up with what you're doing with the Germans. What did you hear about going on in the Pacific? Did, the, uh, did you hear about the battles on the islands and the uh, uh, Marines Corps and stuff like that? Not really. We used to get most of our news from a. Um, there was a cartoonist, and, and there Bill was a Malden. Pe Bill Malden. I yeah. mean, we were more concerned about getting the next. Lillian Joe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. you read Stars and Stripes, and that was about the. Yeah, when we could it. get them. Yeah. yeah, but after the war ended in Europe, we got them more often, and that, that was our only reading, really. And uh, so we didn't know in any great detail what was going on in the Pacific, except that it was rough. We knew it was rough, because of all the jungle. But that's about it. What was your feeling then about uh, these guys that were shooting at you with, because you were a, a Red Cross uh, medic? What did you feel about the Germans back then? I don't think I was as bitter as one might have been. I, uh, I was some, like when we came across their wounded, uh, I wasn't the type that would strip them of their jewelry, of their watches and things like that. I, I was more or less, you know, sorry for them, but glad it was them and not one of ours. Um, so I didn't give it any more, any more depth and thought than that. Um, um, I, as I said, I wasn't really bitter at them, I, but I wasn't unhappy either that they were wounded. I, you know, better them than one of ours. That's how I felt. Yeah. Um, Something you haven't mentioned here, and I haven't asked you, what about what was going on over your head, the air war, uh, uh, that kind of uh, activity and support they may have given you, was there any of that? I was horrified a couple of times we were actually strafed by our own aircraft. That bothered me. Um, the artillery, I don't, I don't, I was not subjected to our aircraft bombing. That I was not subjected to. I was subjected to a lot of German artillery. And the few times that the planes were involved, there were our own planes strafing us with machine guns. That bothered me. Did you shoot back? No, I didn't. Did anybody? Um, no, I think we all ducked for cover. I don't remember anyone actively, because we were surprised. Uh, you know, you, you, you're being strafed and you realize it's the Americans that are strafing you, yeah. you're horrified by that whole thing. Um, and, and that was it. I don't remember us doing anything. I mean, we'd be bitching, you know, we'd be complaining to our captain and they uh, should see to it that that wouldn't happen, but uh, I guess their, their communication wasn't the best. Did you put out any kind of markers to show that you were the good guys? Any kind of uh, colored cloths or something? They never lasted that long. You know, they'd, they'd strafe us, they'd the go, you know, in a couple of minutes it was yeah. all over. So I don't think we even had, nobody even thought of that. I don't think we even had the time to think of that. Frank, is there any, any experience of your whole military career that stands out more than anything else that you'd like to tell us about today? One thing that keeps coming back into your mind. Well, the thing is that, to be honest with you, until recently, uh, I don't think I or any other veteran from World War II discussed their experiences much. I think what broke the ice was Tom Brokaw's book. And you read that, and that brought back uh, memories, or you saw that other men had put down their memories? I, I think it was more or less saying, finally, somebody is describing what we went through. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just before that, there was a movie, Saving Private Ryan. I yeah. remember I became very vocal then, insisting that that should be a movie that should be required viewing by every American because the Americans did not know what war was all about. And I remember becoming very adamant about that and I think that's when I decided to write my autobiography including the military experience. Um, you know, and, and, and I still feel that way until September 11th of last year. 
I don't think Americans realized what it was like to actually have a battle on their own grounds. Um, I mean, you know, what happened then, I mean, as part of the military fighting in Europe, we saw that every day. Every time we went into it was bombed, you know, and then shattered and, and, you know, just devastated. Americans have never seen that. And I remember feeling, gee, somebody, you know, they should really do something about that. And that's when Tom Brokaw came out with his book. I said, wow, I didn't even read the book. I bought it just, just from the title. And uh, I, I felt that that was really uh, a, a big step that Tom took by, by writing. I hope you understand that by coming here today, you have contributed to this legacy. I wonder if there was, it's a, is there a character, some guy that uh, you served with or something that happened in your touring of Sicily uh, that you could tell us about some person that stands out? I, I, the, the one person that comes to mind all the time was the... Uh, <laughs> that one Jeep driver I told you about that. The man was killed, yes. That was killed. Uh, I always think about him. Is there anything I haven't asked you here today that uh, you feel it should be part of this record? Your family's going to look at it, historians are going to look at it personally that you'd like to add to this tape? Well, I, I feel that maybe I got a little too emotional. No, I don't think there's anything that we're missing. Then we thank you very much no. for coming in. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <laughs>